In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A happy Epiphany to all. Today we have great cause for rejoicing. Our manger scenes are now complete. As they've said before, um, we do well if we take full advantage of these mangers in our churches, uh, especially in our houses. They're um, filled with, uh, with good things for us to contemplate. So now that we have a complete manger scene, we can see those two complementary ways that one can approach to Christ. See these two complementary ways, one in the shepherds and another in the magi. So the path of the shepherds, when they are called, they take it right on faith. They hear the word of the angel, they leave what they're doing, they go, they see. Um, They're led just by a simple faith, the faith of a child, a very beautiful thing, which we're all called to. When we look at the Magi, Magi are led by reason. Magi are guided by reason. They don't have an angel who announces things to them, who spells things out clearly. You look, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Rather, they look at what they can see. Look at the physical evidence in the world. They look around at the stars. They look around at what they can discover through reason. They make conclusions based on that, and they proceed. And just so... Um, we need both our faith, both that simple faith, and we need the application of our reason to come down and kneel before our Lord. And because they, they terminate in the same place, the shepherds and the Magi all come, and the termination of both of their activities is in adoring our blessed Lord in his incarnation um, with our blessed mother Mary. Now, it is good to look at these two as as two complementary things because they're both necessary. Because a lack of one can injure um, the good that that each has. Think about faith without reason. We have a simple faith, but we're close to reasoning. We won't think about things. We're we're liable to be deceived, very easily be deceived. Because we don't always know the angel that's talking to us. If we don't, as St. Paul says, you know, put these spirits to the test using our reason then a bad angel, a bad messenger, could be sent to us, and if we just give easy credence to that, we'll be led astray. You can see this has happened many times. We will take, you know, like with the Protestants, they'll take the scriptures out of context, or they'll latch on to something, and be absolutely convinced, even though all the reason will demonstrate, well, no, this is is a wrong interpretation, etc. They'll be absolutely held on to that. And similarly, though, reason without faith can quite more easily err, in a certain sense, right? Because if we rely too much on our own ability to understand things, we, we can fall into rationalism, where we say if it can't be understood by the, man of, by the mind of man, then it's not real. Then it can't be understood at all because it doesn't exist. And that's a way of reducing what God and the things that are holy, of, which are above us, down to our level. So, you know, in the liturgy, oh, if I don't understand why we do something, then we shouldn't do it. You know, warning sign. Warning sign. God and his works don't have to conform to your mind. But they will always be intelligible. They'll always, never be self-contradictory. You know, we can, even though we can't fully comprehend God, we can con- conceive the reason. So we can look and say, well, I know that God can't contradict himself. Or I know that God can sin or lie or do these other bad things. So it can be a corrective in that sense. But not being able to comprehend all these good things of God, then if we put too much weight on our reason, it will fail us. That's why St. Francis de Sales advises that when the devil comes and tries to tempt us um, to a lack of faith, to doubting um, the Holy Church and her holy teachings, the answer really that he says is not to argue, not to get into, into an intellectual debate with the devil. Rather, it's to go, go to the shepherds, go to that simple faith and say, you know, I know what my faith is, I know my God, and I'm not leaving it, and I'm not going to betray it like you did. You know, just go to those acts of will. So we need those two complementary parts. He said it's a great time to look at that, look at that manger, and see that as an image for our soul. That these are the parts of our soul that are coming around to gather and to adore our Lord. You know, and say, do we, do, are, we, are we erring on one side or the other? You know, are we bringing our reason? Are we educating ourselves? You know, if we've been given with good intellects, are we using those rightly to study things? Or are we just saying, oh, I just need the faith of a shepherd? Well, no. Or are we going the other route, you know? 
are we studying everything but not kneeling down like the shepherds and admitting our, our, our humbleness and our inability to comprehend so many of those things. So we want to bring them both together. Um, both come down and kneel before that. We also want to avoid the other dangers, right? The shepherds who didn't come. Sometimes things are too easy. And they're like, well, you know, you can imagine, what about the shepherds who said, oh, well, you know, why do I have to go there? It's really important he's going to come to me. I want to avoid that laziness that conflict the shepherds. Um, and again, that skepticism of the Magi. Well, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to believe. It's too much work. It's founded by laziness, too. But always sort of standing on the end. Those things we want to avoid. Um, we see both these motions, too, these complementary parts of the person reflected very well today in uh, the church's song, rite of song mass. Because we have the, the great uh, chants of the church, which, while they're based on a, on a text, are based on a very simple text. And they're given the full range to fly out um, and to really to speak to one in, in a speech beyond words, like the angels announcing to the shepherds. And when we hear these, we're drawn by that great beauty. Our souls are uplifted, even though we don't really understand maybe what's going on. Like we don't understand the words, just like with the traditional Latin Mass. Well, we may, we may not understand the words. The shepherds were not wise men, and so they, you know, they didn't understand what was going on. They just, they saw with their eyes and they believed in great faith. But the liturgy also does apply to our reason. And that's when we, the, the chanting um, becomes uh, simpler and more intelligible for the readings, sermon, and these other things that are to apply to our reason. We sit and we listen, we contemplate these truths God has revealed. And so we have that nice interplay a great interplay where the shepherds, the angels speak to the shepherds and the, the elements speak to the magi and everyone comes together um, to adore our Lord. So we got everything together. So it's not just rational. You know, one would err, obviously, if you made just a rational liturgy where it's just like, blam, um, without mystery and without, and without those other things. Uh, the second thing, I didn't announce what I was going to talk about beforehand, but uh, the second thing we can look at with this feast um, or to consider what we can, we can do today is make that great act of adoration um, the great act of thanksgiving to God for revealing himself to the Gentiles to the Gentiles the church fathers see very rightly that the shepherds represent the Jews and the Magi represent the Gentiles which is pretty much everyone else it is everyone else We consider that. We give great thanks to that. So the Jews have privileged, just like the shepherds have privileged access, very easy access to the manger, so the Jews had privileged access to God, privileged revelation, which was not shared with anyone else. It was hidden. God was hidden. God was invisible. And it only made known who he was to a very small group of people. And the rest of the world was at sea. The rest of the world had to rely on their reason tainted, uh, darkened by sin, but still their reason. That's where we get natural theology. And that's where we, when we study Socrates and Aristotle and these other great pagan philosophers, we can see how far human reason, undated, can get. It can get quite a lot. You can get to one God. You can get to all these things, like the rightly ordered creation. Not necessarily creation, exactly, but still. You can get all those things uh, through unaided reason. It only takes you so far, and it requires an incredible amount of effort, such that there were very few people, like Plato and Aristotle and the, those others, Plotinus probably, you know, all these later. But we, it takes so much effort to get there. Is, even, that, even that feat of natural theology, coming to, go to know God through nature, was really close to most people. But what does the Incarnation do? The Incarnation makes the invisible visible makes the invisible visible. And so, through the Incarnation and through our Lord's life, now, natural reason has so much more data, if you will, to study. Really, those historical facts. So the Gentiles could have had a great excuse before the Incarnation. They had no idea. How would they? There's no God to see. After the Incarnation, well, now we, we can know historically a lot of things about our Lord to Jesus Christ know exactly when he lived. We have all this historical evidence of what he taught, 
of how he died and how he was brought back from the dead, of how he resurrected. And of all the miracles that he did, those are facts that are known through unaided reason because they're historical record. The incarna- by, by coming down to the incarnation, our Lord makes him subject to natural reason. He makes, him subject, he, makes, he makes God subject to observation and to the contemplation that follows from observation, to human science, of which history is a part. And just so with the church, with the church that he founded, it's a historical entity, a visible entity, which every century gives visible proof of its divine institution. This is why the popes rebuke the modern world for not recognizing the divine institution of the church. Not because they need the faith of shepherds, they just need the intellectual curiosity of the magi because they have all the evidence in front of them to put two and two together. They can look at the church, they can look at how she has been preserved, how her teaching has always been the same through all the generations, they go to all her saints, all the miracles that have been worked, and you can look at the the ebb and the the rise of, of human society, of civilization. When the church is strong, when she's living according to her mission, she raises everything up, everything gets better for everyone. And when Western societies, when those that have been Christianized fall apart, they only do so because the church has faltered. Not the church as the body of Christ, clearly, but just the individual large numbers, at least, of, of, uh, of many within the church. When they betray her mission or drift from that, whole society drifts down. And that's where we see today. Because these two things are connected. On that note, too, the failure of the church's ministers is, again, one more visible proof of her divine institution. No human institution could survive so many bad churchmen, so many bad Catholics, as the church has survived throughout all of her history. It's a great comfort for us, because we know, hey, we can survive this, too. But it's proof, that objective proof, of her divine institution. So we uh, we thank God today for not keeping this a secret, not keeping the Incarnation just known to the shepherds, not keeping his, himself just known to that tiny group, to the Jews, but making himself subject to our powers of observation so that he can call us through those same powers. Again, that means that we have a responsibility, uh, a holy responsibility, one even more serious than those, those pagans had before us, to really use our natural powers to examine things with our mind, to test the spirits, lest we fall into a pietism that accepts, um, you know, just because he said so, because I said so. Okay, well, who are you? You know, so we have this reason to understand. We see that good just line last night. We see that evidence in the Magi themselves. They are told by an authority, by the king, religious authority as well. They're given instructions. Do this. And they agree to do it. Okay, we'll do that. Um, But it became known to them through a dream, but also through their own use of the intellect. Because they have a dream. Okay, I had a dream. Well, what does that mean? Let me examine this. You know, maybe it was just just nothing. So they have to examine that dream. They have to say, you know what? Like, he was acting shady or these other things. And, yeah, you know, I don't think we should trust him. You know, we, we gave him the benefit of the doubt to begin with, but he's doing something evil here. He's acting out of jealousy and envy, and he's trying to crush the king. He's trying to crush um, this, this Lord Jesus Christ. And that's pretty obvious, you know, by, by the actions that he's taking. And so we know that we shouldn't trust this guy. Again, their use of reason in that, um, submitting it to revelation, submitting it to faith, still. The use of reason... That, saves them from great error. It helps reveal this, this evil man to them. So, we, again, we, we ought to do likewise. We must have both the shepherds and the magi in our souls, both working together, coming together, just like at this wonderful Mass, coming together to bow down and to adore our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.